Good morning. Welcome to the uh, fourth lecture in our series, uh, the second methodology lecture. And today we're going to talk about how to deal with data. Um, first, a little motivating example. Uh, this is a picture from the Second World War, I think, if I Googled it correctly. Um, and it's a very famous use case in data analysis. Basically, in the Second World War, they had these uh, bomber planes that were doing these bombing runs, and uh, they would get shot at during their runs, and then they would come back, land, and sometimes they would look like this. They would be shot to pieces, but still be able to go home and, and land. Um, so the people that were making these aircraft and analyzing their data, uh, they were basically looking at where these bomber planes were likely to get hit and thinking, well, maybe we should improve these planes, right? Maybe we should reinforce them. Maybe we should make this a little bit better, uh, make these planes better. And their first intuition was to look at where these planes were commonly being hit and to reinforce those parts, which are, uh, at first thought maybe makes sense uh, to you. Because if a plane comes back like this, you think, okay, well, we need to reinforce the front of the plane. So the next time it gets hit, it doesn't come back looking like that. Um, until some smart man whose uh, name I've forgotten came up with the insight that actually that's not the thing you should do. You should look at where the planes aren't being hit, and those are the parts you should reinforce. Why? Any guesses? Yes, there you go. So the answer is, basically, you're not looking at all of the planes. You're not getting a nice distribution over where a plane is likely to be hit. You're looking at the planes that came back. So if a plane gets hit here, here, or here, it can still fly. Maybe missing a wing, it may look dramatic, but it can still fly. Whereas if you hit it here, here, or here, the plane goes down, and you lose the plane. So those are the parts that you should reinforce. This is called survivorship bias. Basically, if you look at only a population of survivors, then your bias is going to be very skewed. Uh, that's why you should also be careful listening to people's success stories, um, because you're not listening to the people who are not there to tell you their success stories. Um, but that's by the by. The main uh, motivation for today is that you should not take your data at face value. This is something that people do a lot in machine learning. They get a data set and then think, well, Let's apply one of these black box algorithms to it, and let's see if we can get a good accuracy. But actually, you need to think a little bit about where your data comes from and what it's telling you. <coughs> so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, yeah, so like I said last, week, uh, last lecture, this is basic recipe. We're not going to worry about the basic recipe. We're going to worry about what we do before we start doing all the machine learning. So, uh, we'll start with uh, basic cleanup. And we'll discuss three topics, basically uh, how to deal with missing data, how to deal with outliers, and how to deal with class imbalance. We saw class imbalance a little bit already. And we'll talk a little bit about where these features are going to come from, which admittedly is part of the basic recipe, but basically some thoughts about choosing features. And then very important, normalization. Which is basically the idea that many machine learning algorithms require your uh, features, the numbers in your features, to be roughly in the same scale. So they should have uh, you don't want one feature that goes from minus 1,000 to 1,000 and the other feature that stays between minus 1 and 1 uh, because that will screw up a lot of your machine learning algorithms. Uh, and in order to fix that, you need some normalization. Uh, and then in part two, we're going to talk about dimensionality reduction, which is a good pre-processing thing to do. If you have very high dimensional data, you want to... Uh, uh, reduce it, and basically the only th algorithm that we're going to talk about is called principal component analysis, and that will 
basically be most of the, the second half. And then to show you just how powerful that method, that PCA is, I'll show you one example called eigenfaces. Which is a very powerful illustration of, of this uh, PCA stuff. We're going to use a lot of uh, uh, math. The second half is going to be a little bit math heavy. So um, power through, and at the end, I promise there's a nice payoff. But first, some practicalities. How do we, uh, uh, how do we clean up our data? Let's say we have some data set that we want to feed to a machine learning algorithm, but it might have some problems. It might have some missing data, it might have some outliers, and it might have some glass imbalance. So let's start with the missing data. That looks like this. We have a very nice machine learning, uh, machine learning ready data set, except there are these gaps. And we need to deal with these gaps because machine learning algorithms don't know what to do with them unless you tell them. Um, so the very simplest solution if you have missing features is to just remove the feature. If there's a column where there are values missing, just throw out that column. Maybe it's an important column, then you don't want to do that. But if it's not a very important column, just chuck it out and uh, start there. Maybe it doesn't hurt. Then you'd, uh, uh, it's a very easy solution. You can also remove the instances. So remove the rows from your data set where the values are missing. But there you have to be careful that you're not changing the data distribution. So if the instances are missing uniformly, the probability that an instance has a missing value is the same for every instance then it's fine, you're not really changing anything if you remove the, missing val the rows with missing values. But if they're not, let's say your data is gathered by volunteers using some hardware, and only one of your volunteers, the one that uh, gathered the data in Amsterdam, had a hardware problem which caused these missing values, then if you remove the missing uh, values from your data set, you're removing only instances from Amsterdam. So you're sort of reducing the proportion of your data that came from Amsterdam, and that's changing the distribution. Uh, so there's a, a general guiding principle in all of these questions. You're going to run into these questions in your project, and in, in later life if you do more machine learning. Um, and you're going to run into problems that I don't mention here, or that I haven't even thought of. So there's a sort of general overarching principle that's always good to keep in mind if you have to figure out how to deal with something. And that's to think about the real world use case. Where are you going to actually use your machine learning model? So for the purpose of today, we'll call that the production environment, <coughs> which is a sort of software term. If you build some software, you put it somewhere, and that's called production, when people actually start using your software. Uh, it's not always the case with machine learning. It might also be that you're doing sort of business analytics or you're doing science with it. But we'll call whatever you use your model for, we'll call that production. And that environment is what determines all these choices that you make. What do you expect in production? That's what you should be preparing your model for. So the question now is, do you, will you get missing values in production in the same way that they are in your data set? Which might happen, let's say your data comes from a web form, people filling in a web form. If there's one optional question that they don't have to fill in, that's missing data. And that's expected missing data that you will also see in production. So your model has to deal with that missing data. So instead of removing your missing data, you need to train your model somehow to deal with the missing data, which means that you need to keep them in the test set, keep this missing data in the test set, and test how your model performs on data with missing values. But sometimes it's just an artifact of the training data. And you know that once you hit production, you can actually get rid of these missing values in which case you need to make sure that you have a, well, ideally you figure out some way to, have a, to get a test set without missing values that nevertheless represents the data distribution. Um, and then in some way in your training data, you figure out some way to deal with the missing values. You fill them in or you remove them or do something with it. Uh, so that's, but that's an important concern. What's gonna happen in production? So let's say we do, have this ideal situation where we manage to get uh, a test set that doesn't have any missing data, but our training data does have a lot of missing data, and we want to keep, the, keep, the, keep that data to maximize the amount of training data we have. Uh, one thing you can do is imputation. You just fill it in with guesses. You just guess what the value might be. And a very simple way to do it is to use either the mode or the mean uh, value and just see how well it works. 
quite often they're quite rare, these values, these missing values, so then really anything is fine. You just want your machine learning algorithm to run. Um, and if you want to go a bit more fancy, they're a bit more prevalent, then you can try to actually predict them from, predict the missing values from the non-missing values. Basically, if you think of your data set as this table with the target column, instead of making this class target column, you make the column with the missing values your target column, and you can train any machine learning model to predict the column with the missing values in it, because you have some training labels, which are the non-missing values, and then you just fill it in with the predictions from this model, any, any machine learning model will do. And then you have um, a, a complete data set and then you can feed that to your machine learning algorithm. So that's missing data. Um, I would say uh, um, try the simple solutions first and if the simple solutions don't work, then try and go, uh, try and make it more complicated. And the proof uh, is always in the pudding. So it's always, you always check how well do you do on the data, on the test set. And if you don't do well enough, then you start making the solutions more uh, complex. So that's missing values. Let's look at some uh, a related artifact, which is outliers. Basically values that don't really seem to belong to your data distribution. So if you plot your data, you might see something like this, very natural, organic, noisy data. And then suddenly here, there are six values which are uh, all negative, while the rest of your data set is negative. And they're all minus one, so they're very mechanically aligned. So if you look at something like that, you think, well, probably something went wrong. Maybe somebody had missing values, was filling in a form, didn't know what to fill in for a missing value, just filled in minus one. That can happen. Uh, so if that happens, these are sort of st uh, things that are mechanical errors, mistakes, you want to get rid of them somehow. Basically, the best thing is to treat these as missing values and then do whatever you did for your missing values. But there's another class of outliers, and it's a very important distinction to make, which is the natural outliers. So if you think about a, a distribution of income, then most of us uh, have a, a normal modest income, and there's a very few, a very small number of people who have gigantic incomes, like uh, Bill Gates over here. I probably should replace this by Jeff Bezos by now. Uh, And basically, this is not an artifact. This is not a mistake. This is a property of the distribution of incomes. It just so happens that income is not distributed normally. So if you have a normal distribution, like height, you have a fixed scale. Not everybody has the same height, but you do know roughly what, what heights to expect. Very few people are shorter than one meter, and very, very few people are larger than three meters. If you go one meter further, then you will not, you'll probably never ever see one person who is taller than four meters, or less tall than zero meters, of course. Um, so that's a normal distribution. There's variance, but it has a fixed scale. You know exactly what to expect, and you know there are extremes where you can basically say that's never gonna happen. Even though it has some, theoretically has some probability mass, it's never gonna happen. Income doesn't have that kind of fixed scale. It's, a, it's what we call a scale-free distribution where you have lots of people who have uh, make between 10,000 and 100,000 euros a year, and then very few people make a million dollars a year, or euros a year, and then very, very few people make 10 million, and very, very, very few people make 100 million. But there's still people, if you look at the whole world, there are still people for all these extremes. There are still people who make, there's probably still somebody somewhere who makes a billion dollars a year. So that's a non-normal distribution, and those outliers are very important to keep in your distribution in order to ensure a good fit. Here's another example in the realm of uh, faces. So if you're looking at faces as your data set, this is clearly not a face. It's not a, uh, on the right, it's clearly not a face. That's clearly some mechanical artifact, some compression thing, some bit got flipped somewhere, so it doesn't, uh, you can chuck this out of your data set to clean it up. But on the left, it's just an unusual face. In this case, the face of a comedian called Marty Feldman, uh, who made very good use of his unusual features. And that's unusual, and that's an extreme in the space of all faces, in the distribution of all faces. But it's an extreme you want in there in order to ensure a good fit. 
in order to know that these are the extremes of your space, which is a very helpful example to keep. <coughs> so this is a rule for outliers. Are they mistakes or are they part of the data distribution? Um, and if so, leave them be. But make sure that your model is not assuming that your data is normal. Or at least check if your model has some kind of assumption of normality in it, um, which might be sneakier than you think. For instance, this uh, linear or this regression that we were talking about with the squared error uh, uh, loss function, that's based on an assumption of normality, which we'll talk about uh, next Monday. Uh, so these assumptions about normal distributions can uh, hide in your model without you knowing it. And doesn't always hurt. In the case of linear regression, it's actually probably fine if you just use it on these kinds of data, but um, it's important to check and it's important to be aware. And again, the question is, can you expect them in production? If so, make sure the model can deal with it. If not, then make sure you have a test set that represents a production situation so that you can then test whatever you do with your training set, you can test, uh, validate it on your test set. So it's outliers. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll talk about why mean squared errors are uh, normally uh, have a normality assumption. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, what you could also do is model noise with a heavy tail distribution with one of these uh, scale-free distributions, which is a bit advanced, so we don't go into that. Um, and the proof is always in how well do you ultimately do on this test set. So make sure that the test set represents the production situation and then just validate stuff on the test set. So that's outliers. Uh, which means we are here. And we can talk about features. Where do these features come from? And how do we turn data that doesn't look like it's features into data that is features? So something you might get before we get to more uh, complicated stuff like learning from images or learning from natural language or learning from music, you might get a data set like this. So there's like a, uh, an Excel uh, sheet or a table in a database. And you might think, well, I can do machine learning on this. This is a table. Machine learning is the basic recipe of machine learning is, is learning from tables. This is tables, so we can just stick this into a machine learning algorithm. Uh, but we're not quite there yet, because machine learning algorithms can really only consume two types of features, categoric and numeric. And a lot of them can only consume numeric features and some of them can only consume categoric features. Um, so for a lot of these data types, you need to figure out how to turn it into a feature. How to turn it, sorry, how to turn it into a numeric value or how to turn it into a categoric value. Uh, so let's look at some examples to give you the idea of what to think about. Um, yeah, so this is stuff you might encounter and this is really the only thing that you, uh, that you should transform to. Let's start with age, which is very simple. So age is an integer. <coughs> Most um, machine learning algorithms that expect numeric features expect uh, real valued features. So uh, 1.5 should also be allowed, but that's not usually a problem. So if you just take the integers and stick them, keep them as integers, that's usually fine. Most algorithms will deal with that. Um, and we're going to normalize probably anyway, so then it will become real valued. Um, if you have to transform age to a categorical feature, that's a little bit more tricky because you're always going to lose information. You have to somehow put it into two bins, into chunks of this range, and say, well, uh, for instance, if you wanted to put it into two bins, you can make it a binary feature and indicate whether somebody is above or below the median age, which is very valuable, but uh, uh, which it, it still holds a lot of information, but you are losing information. So ideally, you don't do this. But it can happen that you have lots of other features that are all categoric, and you really want to use a machine learning algorithms that can only use categorical features. So then you can say, okay, I'm just gonna uh, take that hit and reduce the information in the uh, in the age feature, and we'll just uh, we'll uh, we'll just accept that loss of information. Uh, phone numbers are a little bit more interesting. So at first sight, this might look like a number to you. Phone number, you could represent it as an integer. 
So you could say, well, I'm going to transform that integer to a number and feed that to my machine learning algorithm. But that really doesn't work. I mean, it works in the sense that it will run. But um, the numeric value of a phone number, interpreting this as a number, really doesn't tell you anything interesting about the number. What you're saying is basically that this is a bigger number than this. But if your phone number is a bigger number than my phone number, that really doesn't tell you anything. So you're looking at this as a kind of ordered space of numbers, when that ordering is really very ir irrelevant. Uh, so here you have to think a little bit harder about what kind of information is inside that phone number that I can use and that's going to be valuable for my classification task, for my regression task. Um, and in the case of phone numbers, you can look, for instance, at the area code. So in uh, Dutch phone numbers, it's the first three numbers. Uh, in Dutch non-mobile phone numbers. Or you can look, indeed, at whether it's a mobile phone number or not a mobile phone number, which in Dutch phone numbers is when it starts with 06, as you all know. It's a mobile phone number. If it doesn't, then it's a landline. Uh, so these are good categorical features, but you have to extract them from this phone number feature. Uh, so you have to think about these things beforehand. And that's, this is not really a science. I mean, there's no fixed way of doing it. It's an art. You have to sort of think about what information might be in there that I can ex extract that might be helpful for my uh, machine learning algorithm. Finally, there's a... Um, special case where you have a, a categorical feature given, let's say a genre of a movie, but your machine learning algorithm only accepts numeric features. That happens very often. I mean, really, the m most of the m um, more interesting modern machine learning algorithms only accept numeric features. So then you have to go from categoric to numeric, ideally in a way that doesn't lose you any information. There's two uh, flavors, integer coding and one-hot coding. So integer coding is just you say, well, I have five, uh, four or five, uh, four genres. So I assign them the numbers one through four. And then I have integers, and I feed that through the algorithm as a numeric feature. But then you have the same problem again that we saw earlier with the phone numbers, is that you're imposing an order on these genres that's not there. And your machine learning algorithm, because it's a numeric feature, is going to look at this order. It's going to see comedy as one bigger than thriller and twice as big as romance, which is meaningless. So it's going to try and find these patterns that aren't there. So somehow you need to convert this to a numeric feature in a way that tells the algorithm that, it's, um, yeah, that, these, that this is a set and not a, a list, not an ordering. Uh, the most popular way of, to, of doing that is called one-hot coding, where you basically, instead of turning this one categorical feature into one numeric feature, you turn one categorical feature into four numeric features, or however many um, categories you have. And basically, you indicate the fact that this particular instance has the genre sci-fi with a row of numbers that are all zero except the relevant genre. Oh, uh, question? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the question is, is this problem that I described for integer coding, is that always going to be a problem, or can we sometimes use it? Um, I can't, at the moment, I can't think of a good reason not to use one hot coding instead. Uh, maybe if there is an ordering in your genres, um, or if you really have some weird reason to prefer only one feature, but features are, features are cheap. You can use as many features as you like, usually. Um, so at least at the moment, maybe I'll come up with something later, but at the moment, I cannot think of a way, a reason to prefer integer coding. Um, yeah, so usually this is what you do. You blow up your single feature into multiple features, and then uh, the, the numeric, this, this size has a meaning, because if this feature is bigger, it means it's more sci-fi. Just have, happen to have two numeric values. And the uh, uh, relations between genres are relations between features, so that makes more sense, because the features are set. Um, 
So that's all I wanted to say about you know, getting features out of your data. <coughs> but there's another trick that you can use that can be very useful, which is getting features, as it were, out of your features. Um, so expanding the features that you have to more features in order to make your model more powerful. Here's a data set we've seen already uh, called the XOR data set or the XOR problem, XOR. XOR. It stands for exclusive OR for the uh, non-computer scientists. So let's make it more concrete. Let's say we have a, a, an email uh, data set. We're trying to classify it as um, hammer spam. And we have two features. One is the extent to which it mentions drugs, which usually means something spam, except if it's sent to a pharmacy. Then, it men uh, then mentioning drugs is very natural, and it's probably ham. And not mentioning drugs is probably unnatural. It's a slightly contrived example, but uh, we go with it to, uh, just to explain how, how you might get a pattern like this. So basically, we have two features that are interrelated. We need to know the value of one feature in order to interpret the value of the other feature. Um, so if it does mention drugs and sent to a pharmacy, it's uh, ham. Or if it doesn't mention drugs and it's not sent to a pharmacy, then it's ham, and otherwise it's probably spam. Uh, so a linear classifier can't do this, right? A linear classifier, there's no line that separates these two classes, e even though they're very neatly separable. There's no line that separates these two classes. And it also shows you the kind of thing that a linear classifier cannot do. It cannot, what, uh, like I said, look at the value of one feature to interpret the value of another feature. Uh, let me just check the time quickly. Um, So there are two options. You make your model more powerful, or you expand your features. In this case, what you can do is you can add the cross product. So these are the features we have. Does mention drugs, is it sent to a pharmacy? With the extent to which it mentions drugs and the extent to which it's sent to a pharmacy, you'll just uh, imagine for yourself how that might work. But um, what we can do is we can add another feature that is the uh, that just is multiplies the values of of these two existing features. And what happens with negative and positive numbers, if you multiply two positive numbers, it becomes positive. If you multiply two negative numbers, it becomes positive. And if you multiply a negative and a positive number, it becomes negative. So if we just look at the sign of this, um, this feature, so essentially we are putting a classification boundary here we are ignoring these features and we put the classification boundary at zero for this feature. So we can say anything positive here we classify as positive, anything negative we classify as negative. We get this shape, this classifier, which exactly classifies what we are uh, looking for. Uh, so basically the example, I mean, this is a contrived example where it works very, very neatly and you only have to look at this other feature, but basically by extending our feature space, by combining the existing features into more, uh, more features, we allow a linear classifier on this higher space to draw nonlinear shapes in our original feature space. I'll give you another example. Here we have, uh, I don't have an example for how this might occur, but uh, what we have here is a, um, a class of uh, red points with a circular um, decision boundary. So everything that is a distance to the origin of, what is it, about 75, 0.75 to the origin uh, is colored red, gets the red class, and everything else gets the blue class. So again, very separable, but not linearly separable. Linear classifiers would have no idea what to do with this. But if we get one extra, f if we get one feature that expresses the distance to the origin, or multiple features from which we can derive linearly the distance to the origin, we can do this. Um, oh, I don't have a slide that explains what the features would be. I'll do that on the blackboard then. Uh, so the distance to the origin, which is sort of the size of the vector that points to a point. So let's say we have a point here. We have the origin here. Uh, and we have two features, x and y. Then basic, basic Pythagoras will tell you that uh, 
let's call it uh, d, that d squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. That's Pythagoras, right? So the d, if we move the square to the other side, the distance is just the square of these things. Uh, well, actually, to make the features nicer, we can also keep the uh, square here. Basically, what we're looking for in this example, uh, where we want to put the decision boundary, is where the d is, uh, if d is uh, less than 1, we want to color it red. If it's bigger than 1, we want to color it blue. Uh, and it just so happens that the square of, oh, it's not 1, right? So, uh, well, that doesn't matter. So if d squared is bigger than some value, which we can learn, so it doesn't matter what it is, we want to color it blue. If it's smaller than some value, we want to color it red. Which means that if we add x squared and y squared as features, a linear classifier can work out this part, right? So we add two new features, which are uh, x squared and y squared. And then we get, uh, we can solve this problem. Uh, and I can actually show this. You can do this for yourself in the TensorFlow Playground. Uh, so what we see here is, well, let's start with the uh, the XOR data set and linear classifier. So linear classifier has no idea what to do. Let's turn off the extra features. Oh. Something has happened. Oh, it's still in the slides. Uh, Again. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, linear classifier has no idea what to do, just sort of stays there. And what we can do here is we can turn on these extra features. So, this is x1 squared, x2 squared, and the product of x1 and x2. So, if we just turn on this one, uh, you see that the decision boundary changes to a nonlinear value because we're now doing linear classification in this 3D space and projecting back to the original 2D space. And if we start training, it will slowly converge. I set the learning rate very low so that it, you can see what's happening. And it slowly converges. And same thing for the uh, uh, circle data set. If we just add the x1 and x2, the squares of both the features, uh, we don't need this one. I mean, we can include it. The machine learning algorithm is more than smart enough to just ignore it if it's not helpful. But let's uh, exclude it. And you can see that it slowly forms a uh, circular decision boundary. You can also see, by the way, the clearest here, the original in the XOR example. You can see uh, these lines here are the weights. So that's how much it's looking at each feature. And as we saw, we really only needed this feature. The other two features we can kind of ignore to solve this classification problem. Uh, so if we let it learn a while, we should see that these two weights here go to zero, become very small. I can't really see from here. Uh, yeah, so they become smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is the only weight it's really looking at. Uh, I lost my original.
All right, so expanding your feature space can help you to uh, get a more powerful model. Uh, it also works for regression, so here we see a very uh, nonlinear uh, relation. So a linear, a linear line would, wouldn't fit very well. So if we expand this uh, feature space and we fit, we add the feature x squared to the uh, features, we get a parabola. And basically what you're seeing here is that you're sort of thinking about this in two, you can think about this model in two different ways. You can say, well, it's a, a, a more, for, uh, more powerful model because it's the parabolas. We're fitting a parabola to the data instead of a linear space. Or it's a linear fit in a higher dimensional space. And the reason that's interesting is because linear fitting, fitting a linear line is very easy to do. You can do this. Uh, you don't really need to search for your model. You can just work it out analytically. Uh, you have a convex loss surface, so it uh, works very well. So, so long as this trick works, so long as you can s look at your model as a, um, this kind of expanded feature space, you know you have a very cheap and effective solution to find the best model, to find the optimal model. Finally, class imbalance. We talked about this a little bit already. So this is something that if you do um, machine learning on real data, you're probably going to run into. Uh, and again, uh, your test set should reflect your production environment. So if there's a class imbalance in your production environment, your test set should have this class imbalance. There's nothing you can do about that. So the only thing is to make sure that your test set is big enough, that it includes enough of these uh, uh, minority class examples. And like we saw in the last lecture, don't look at accuracy, try things like R ROC plots. And then when your test set is in place and it reflects your production environment, you can try and play around with your training data. Your training data, you're allowed to manipulate to see if it can help you uh, achieve a higher accuracy or a higher uh, AOC. Um, so two very uh, simple ways of doing this are undersampling and oversampling. So you can just oversample your minority class with replacement to create a bigger balance, but only in your training set. Or you can do the opposite. You can undersample your, because uh, this gives you duplicates in your data. Sometimes you don't want duplicates. You may want to undersample your majority class. Um, and if you want to go even fancier, you can try data augmentation so that these New things you're sampling aren't uh, duplicates of things that are already in your data set, but are slightly manipulated, slightly maybe add a little noise or follow an algorithm like SMOT. I won't go into that, but it sort of looks for midpoints between existing points. Uh, follow this link if you want to try something like that. Or if you have a specific domain like images, then you can maybe try and rotate every image a little bit or give it a little bit of translation so that this new uh, training data you're sampling to fix your class imbalance is new, but not, uh, is actually new. It's not a duplicate of data that you already have. So finally, uh, normalization. I guess I won't finish with normalization, but we'll start before the break at least. Um, so here's a motivating example. Let's say you're doing K nearest neighbor regression, uh, sorry, K nearest neighbor classification. And you have two features. One is the year of birth. And the other is uh, pupil dilation, so how far the pupils of the eye are dilated. I don't know what classification task this would be, just uh, let's just go with it. Just, it's just a, a motivating example. So in your feature space, you might say, well, if it's looking at two neighbors, these neighbors are both very close. So those are the two neighbors you should look at. Uh, if you look at sort of the spread of the data, uh, then those are the closest two neighbors. But actually, if you look at the actual distances, this one has a distance of 40, and this one has a distance of 0 0.002. So this one is much, much closer in the space of the data than this one. And really, what you get here is that a K nearest neighbor classifier is not really going to look at date of birth, year of birth. Um, and it's really only going to look at this pupil dilation, even though in the sort of shape of the data, this one is pretty close. So what you want to do is you want to normalize. 
You want to make sure that both features have the same scale, so that you're looking at the shape of your data and not the sort of absolute values of your features. Uh, so I'll uh, show you two uh, simple ways of normalizing before the break, and then uh, leave the whitening, the more complicated one, until after the break. So a very simple way of normalization. Uh, yeah, we have basically three, uh, three versions, three uh, ways of doing this, normalization, standardization, and whitening. Um, these terms are sort of used interchangeably. If you see this in the wild, any one of these three terms may be used to refer to any one of the others. So be careful that it actually, when you read about something like this, that it actually says what you think it says. But within the course, we'll use them like this, uh, which is also how they're used on Wikipedia. So let's take that as a standard. And let's start with normalization, which is just squeezing your data uh, into the range between 0 and 1. So you just figure out what the minimum is, what the maximum is. You shift it over so that it starts at 0. So you subtract the mean. Shift the whole thing. Note that min is, uh, you, sorry, you subtract the minimum. Note that the minimum is negative here. So basically, you're adding this value. You shift the whole thing over so that it starts at 0. And then you multiply it by the range, which is sort of squeezing it back to the range between 0 and 1. If you do that for all your features, then everything is normalized between 0 and 1, and you're probably uh, good to go. So it looks like this. Uh, another thing you can do is to uh, squeeze it uh, and translate it to the shape of a standard normal distribution. So you make sure that the mean of your data is at 1, and that the variance of your data is uh, Sorry, the mean of your data is at 0, and the vari variance of your data is 1, which is basically the same thing. So you subtract the uh, value you want to hit 0. So in this case, we want to put the mean at 0, so we subtract the mean. And then we squeeze the whole thing until the variance becomes 1. And then it looks, at least to the extent that we can achieve with a um, linear transformation, it looks like it was sampled from a distribution that had its mean at 0 and its variance at 1. Uh, and normally, that's sort of fine. In almost all machine learning cases, this is fine. You do, do this per feature, and then your machine learning algorithm can figure out the rest. Uh, but if you look at the data, if you look at what's happening, um, and if you think about it like you want to um, transform your data so that it looks like it came from a standard normal distribution, so it looks like it came from this uh, distribution, uh, then that works fine if you have data like this. If you whiten this, then it becomes this nice sphere. So it becomes what's called a multivariate normal distribution, a standard multivariate normal. So you have the mean at 0, and in every direction the variance is 1, and the axis the features are uncorrelated. So knowing the value of one feature doesn't help you to predict the value of another feature. Features are independent, statistically independent in that way. Uh, so if I know where I am on this axis, it doesn't tell me anything about where I am on this axis. Uh, and that works fine if your data looks like this. If it's this kind of ellipse that is aligned with the, uh, with the axis, then we can just do per feature normalization. But if it looks like this, which it usually does, and we normalize per feature, then we end up with this. We don't end up with this nice sphere. We end up with data that is still correlated, where features are still related to each other. And for various reasons, it's actually nice to end up with this, to do a, a slightly nicer um, normalization that takes into account all the correlations, that takes into account the whole data, and reduces it to this kind of sphere in your space. And that's called whitening, uh, which is a good way of doing normalization. And it will tell us something later about how to do dimensionality reduction. So let's leave it there for the break. And in 15 minutes, we'll pick up with how to do whitening. All right, find your seat. Let's get started again. Uh, a lot to get through, so I'll I have to slightly rush through all the mathematics. I hope the, the global picture will still be clear. <coughs> so let's start where we left off with this whitening. What we saw is that if we normalize per feature, <coughs> it works pretty well, and our features are all the same scale, but they might still be correlated. 
they might still look like this. And if we, <clears throat> and what we ideally want is uncorrelated features. Uh, so uh, data that looks like this nice sphere around the mean. So the question is, if we really want to put in the work, can we do that? Uh, yes, we can, and it's called whitening. <coughs> so essentially what we're doing is if we have data like this, we want a transformation, a linear transformation, that makes it look like this. Or alternatively, we can also look at these axes, axes and say we want to transform the axes so that they look like this. This is sort of a different way of thinking about it. And that's called uh, uh, choosing a different basis for your data, a different coordinate system, which is really just what we're doing. Um, and it's a very standard linear uh, algebra operation. So let's, talk, let's uh, explain that. Uh, to explain that, I need a couple of preliminaries. First, remember that if you sum two vectors, it looks like this. So if you have two vectors A and B, B, uh, if you want the sum of those two vectors, you're essentially summing the uh, independent elements. So you're summing the x value of this one plus the x value of this one becomes the x value of C. The same for Y. But visually, what you can say is basically I take the bottom end of this one and I stick it on the top end of this one. And then I draw a line from the origin to the resulting vector. And that's your sum. That's the sum of your two vectors. So just something to keep in mind when you sum vectors, that's what it looks like. So now let's talk about bases. bases. Basically, your coordinate system. Um, so this is a, a, a basically a way to think about this Cartesian coordinate system that we always use. It's essentially made up of two special vectors. This one that points from the origin to 0, 1, uh, to 1, 0. Oh, sorry, this one that points from the origin to 1, 0, and this one that points to the origin from the origin to 0, 1, to the two unit vectors. And essentially, every point, when we say that a point has coordinate 3, 2, what we're saying, it's the sum of 3 times the first unit vector and 2 times the second unit vector. That's really what we mean by this coordinate system. When we say you move three steps to the right and two steps up, you're summing the red vector three times uh, and the uh, <coughs> green vector two times. And that gives us the intuition to talk about other basis vectors. So if we pick two other vectors, Let's say they're orthogonal in this case. So we have a purple vector that points in a random direction and a orange vector that points orthogonally to that. It doesn't really need to point orthogonally, but it, in this case it does. Then we get a new system of axes. And our blue point, which was 3, 2 in our uh, standard basis system, now gets new coordinates in this new basis system. It's the same point, it just gets new coordinates because we've used a new basis. So in this case, the purple vector was, uh, had this uh, value, and the orange vector had this value. And we get to the blue point by adding a certain number of, uh, adding the, the c vector a certain number of times to the d vector a certain number of times. In this case, they're not integers, they're real values, but works basically the same. And that gives us xs, which is the blue point in standard coordinates which means that in the new coordinates of the basis system, this new basis system uh, that uh, is, is um, defined by these two vectors, the new coordinates are 2.5 and 0 0.5. So let's uh, generalize the notation for that. Basically, if, uh, usually for this basis system, you uh, stick the, two ba the, well, the multiple basis vectors into, uh, into a matrix as columns. So you just concatenate the basis vectors into a matrix we'll call B, and that defines your basis. And if you want to get from a point in this basis to a point in the standard basis, you just multiply it by B, and which means that if you want to do the opposite, if you want to go from the standard basis 
to the uh, new basis, you multiply it by the inverse of B. So the inverse of B is just a the particular matrix operation, which is a bit expensive and a bit numerically imprecise if you have to compute it. So what we like to do, not sure why there's a mirror effect here. <laughs> that's, a, that's an accident. I'm not trying to be fancy. Um, <laughs> but what we like to do, because this matrix inverse is um, uh, difficult to compute and numerically imprecise to compute, uh, what we like to do is pick bases for which this matrix is orthonormal, which means that the basis vectors have length 1, and they are orthogonal to each other. The angle between any two basis vector, uh, between any pair of basis vectors is 90 degrees. Because if that's the case, then the matrix inverse is equal to the matrix transpose. Matrix transpose is just flipping around the diagonal. So putting this point here and this point here, matrix transpose. So that's very easy and very numerically precise to compute. So then we can transform from a basis and back, uh, back and forth between bases just with this matrix transpose. So we like orthonormal bases. That's what that says. Um, so now we need one more ingredient to talk about uh, before we can show how to do this whitening, uh, which is this multi uh, varied normal distribution that I already talked about. Let's uh, look at how that actually looks, what its parameters are. So it's basically a generalization of the normal distribution that we all know and love to multiple dimensions. So its mean is just uh, a point in space. So its mean is a vector. And it's uh, what's, uh, what, what is the variance in a one-dimensional normal distribution becomes a covariance matrix in a multivariate normal distribution where the diagonal gives you the uh, variance in each dimension, in each direction, and the off-diagonal elements are the uh, covariances, so how much the uh, <coughs> dimensions are correlated. So the bigger the off-diagonal element, the more this looks like this kind of diagonal line. Uh, and if you want to fit a multivariate normal distribution to your data, so you have some data, but you don't have these parameters. You want to go the other way. Uh, next week, we'll look in depth more about how this works. But for now, I'll just give you the formulas. Basically, working out the mean is just the way you work out a mean. You just sum all the elements and divide it by uh, the number of elements, except in this case, these are vectors. Uh, these should be superscripts. I've just realized them. My notation is inconsistent with the previous lectures, but these are vectors representing your points. Uh, and then to compute this sample covariance, what you do is you subtract the mean from every element in your data set. So basically what you're doing, it's the same thing we've been doing before, you just shift the whole data set so that its mean is at the origin, is at zero. And then for this mean shift, uh, for this mean center data, you take uh, the data matrix times its transpose, and you divide it by n, uh, n minus 1. And that gives you the covariance matrix. For now, just take my word for it. Uh, next week, probably, we'll go into this a little bit deeper. Um, but for now, just take my word for it. This, is, this gives you a est good estimate of what your uh, parameters are for your uh, normal distribution. And the nice thing about these multivariate normal distributions that can be really helpful in interpreting them is that you can think of any multivariate normal distribution as a transformation of the standard multivariate normal distribution. So the standard one is the one that have mean zero and uh, variance one in every direction. The slides are a little weird here. Um, not sure what happened, some points missing here. But let's so uh, this is what we how we draw the let's say we draw the standard MVN like this. So it has the mean zero, variance one in every direction and no correlations. And if we apply a linear transformation to this, so we multiply it by some matrix and translate it, then the result will be another uh, multivariate normal distribution. And every multivariate normal distribution can be described 
as a transformation, as a linear transformation uh, of this standard MVN in the following way. So if you, uh, let's think about it as sampling from this transform distribution. So if we start with a standard, uh, standard multivariate normal, we draw a number x, a vector x, sorry, from this standard normal. We transform x, so we multiply it by some matrix A and we add some value t. Then y is a sample from this multivariate normal distribution. So the t is just the mean of this uh, new distribution that we're drawing, that we're sampling from. And the covariance is this transformation matrix times its transpose. So that's just a trick, a way of thinking of multivariate normal distributions. Uh, so just to illustrate that, here we start with the multivariate normal distribution. We sample some point. Oop. Then we transform the multivariate normal distribution by A. In this case, it sort of squeezes it and rotates it a little bit. So our point that we sampled ends up here. And then we translate it so the point that we samples end up, sampled ends up here. So now, finally, we know how to do whitening. Because all we want to do now is just take this transformation and reverse it. Instead of going from standard normal distribution, instead of sampling our data, we want to sort of unsample our data. We want to start with this distribution and transform it backwards to this. Problem is we don't know A and T, but we, can, we know how to compute A and T. So we can compute the sample covariance matrix and the mean from the data. Then we find some A such that this holds. This is the relation between A and the uh, sample covariance, or A and the covariance, sorry. Um, and there are many ways to do this. Just standard linear algebra operations, just a Cholesky decomposition. You can do singular value decomposition, which we'll talk about next, or the just use the matrix square root here. And then to whiten the data, you just subtract, you just do the opposite of this transformation. So first you subtract the mean, and then you multiply by the inverse of A. And then you get your whitened data, which is, looks like a standard normal distribution. So that's a lot of work just to normalize your data. And like I said, it's usually not necessary. This per feature normalization is usually fine, but it can help a lot to inspire a very nice dimensionality reduction method. So let's talk about that next. Sometimes you have very high dimensional data. Like if, you, uh, if your data has pictures, and you just flatten out the picture so that every pixel is a, a, a feature like we saw earlier. Then you have something like 784 features if, you're da if you're, even if your data is, is very small, so 28 by 28 uh, pixels, you get a lot of features. And some machine learning algorithms can handle that fine and some can't. So if you, the algorithm that you want to use is in the uh, second category, you want to reduce the dimensionality of your data. Which is uh, just the task of finding new features that are in some way derived from the old features that retain as much information, as much relevant information as, uh, as you can retain. And you usually do this without looking at the target feature, at least for the one uh, the method we'll discuss today. We won't look at the class, we'll just look at the data and try and project that down to a lower dimensional space while retaining as much information as possible from the original data. Uh, and really, when you talk about dimensionality reduction, there's only one place to start, and that's principal component analysis. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, which is a, um, a method that really does two things. It does whitening and it does dimensionality reduction. So basically it's a whitening step in the way that we just discussed. It's a basis transformation to a standard uh, multivariate normal, which consists of orthonormal, of an orthonormal transformation. So it's this nice uh, basis transformation that, um, that you can invert very easily and then scaling per dimension. 
and it orders these dimensions in this reduced in this uh, this basis when it transforms to this new basis system uh, you can basically permute the dimensions any way you like right if you map from one basis to another the dimensions can be in any order you can map any dimension in your original data space to any dimension in your new data data space so instead of doing that in an arbitrary way what pca does is it orders them by variance captured so you know that the first dimension in your new space that you've uh, mapped to captures the maximum amount of uh, variance in your original data and the second dimension captures the second most variance in your uh, original data and so on uh, and as we'll see that can be very useful in reconstructing your data in, in ensuring that you capture as much information because what you can do in this new space in this new basis you can just take the first k features and discard the rest and that's your dimensionality reduction so we do this whitening step in this special way with this PCA. And then we just take the first, let's say, five features, and we discard the rest, and that's our dimensionality reduced data. And we'll see later why this maximizing the variance captured, why that's important in maintaining uh, as much information as, as possible. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about how this works. Uh, and for that, I'll need to explain eigenvectors. If you've done linear algebra, you should know a little bit about eigenvectors as well, but it pays to refresh your, uh, your memory. So let's look at one of these transformations. Basically, you multiply a vector by a matrix. That's a transformation. Um, so if you look at all the vectors in a plane, if it's a transformation on the plane, a transformation like A, matrix A, does something like this. It, stretches the plane in some direction. Maybe it rotates it a little bit, or maybe it flips it around. <coughs> so you can see, we look at what happens to all the vectors in your plane. And then there are some spe special vectors, which are called eigenvectors. And those are the vectors, vectors whose direction doesn't change. So their uh, magnitude changes. They maybe get stretched, but they uh, don't change direction. So here, the red vector gets stretched and changes direction. But the blue, blue vector doesn't change direction. And we call that an eigenvector. So in uh, two dimensions, it looks like this. If, um, uh, and uh, the, it, um, your uh, transformation doesn't always have eigenvectors. So if A is a rotation, then it doesn't have eigenvectors, because every single uh, vector will change direction under a rotation. But if you rotate in three dimensions, uh, then you will have an eigenvector. So if I rotate myself, then this direction, this, I, this vector, if I rotate, does change direction, right? But this vector doesn't. See what I mean? So this, if I rotate around my, my axis, then this is the eigenvector. Uh, so if you do that, if you... Um, I put that mathematically, it looks like this. So if we take a vector u, we multiply it by a, and u is an eigenvector, then the result should just be uh, a scalar value multiplied by u. Because it doesn't change direction, it just changes magnitude. So this is an eigenvector of a, and this is called the eigenvalue of that eigenvector. <coughs> Sometimes it's very easy to figure out what the eigenvectors are. For instance, if you have a scaling matrix, which just squeezes or stretches along the dimensions. Uh, that's a matrix that looks like this. So it's a diagonal matrix. It only has non-zero values on the diagonal. Then it's very easy. Then the eigenvectors are the axis, the basis of your system, the basis vectors of your system. Uh, and these are its eigenvalues. Then it's, very, uh, then it's very simple. If it isn't very simple, and you have something like this, Let's say we want these to be the eigenvectors of our transformation. Uh, what you can do is uh, just operate in uh, three steps. You first rotate the matrix so that the eigenvectors are axis aligned. Then you apply a scaling matrix, and then you rotate back. So we rotate this until the eigenvectors are axis aligned. We apply the scaling matrix. So this is a diagonal. Ma this is a rotation matrix. This is a diagonal matrix. 
which has a squeezing, and then we rotate back. And because this is an orthonormal basis, we know that we can rotate back by just taking the transpose, which means that the sequence of transformations, u, z, u, apply to any uh, vector, <coughs> is the same as A. So what we've done is we've decomposed the matrix A into three separate matrices. So the matrix A is just multiplying u by z by u. That's called an eigen decomposition. Uh, it doesn't always exist for all matrices, but uh, for our purposes it does. Uh, Oh yeah, and by convention we tend to sort the diagonal from largest eigenvector to smallest uh, because we, well, uh, u is an arbitrary orthonormal uh, basis transformation so we can just choose u so that this is true. Uh, I'll skip this for sake of time. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the eigenvectors of this covariance matrix. Why? What does that tell us? Well, we know that the covariance matrix is this um, uh, uh, product of this transformation that we're looking at, the transformation from the standard normal MVN to the real MVN that we're looking at. Uh, so if we look at the eigen decomposition, and I'll go through this a little bit quickly, but basically you can rewrite, if you look at the eigen decomposition of A of this transformation that we're looking at, then you can do a bit of rewriting, and if you look up the properties of the transpose on Wikipedia, you can follow along that this actually works. And you can see that the eigen decomposition of S is basically the same as the eigen decomposition of A, except that the, um, we have this diagonal matrix in the middle that is, uh, occurs twice. That just means that the diagonals are squared, but the basis transformation is the same. So the eigenvectors are the same, and the eigenvalues are squared which means, which means, sorry, uh, that if we think about this transformation to our data from a uh, multivariate normal to our data, that the eigenvectors of that transformation are the eigenvectors of our uh, covariance. And those are the, the, the directions in which the data is stretched the most, as it were. So the eigenvector with the highest eigenvalue is the direction in which the data is stretched the most. So here's the principal component analysis algorithm. First, we mean center the data to get rid of this, uh, this translation. We compute the sample covariance, and we take its eigen decomposition. Uh, practically, you do this usually with something called the singular value decomposition, which I, I skipped for time. And then we trans once we have these eigenvectors, we transform the data back to this, um, this uh, space that now looks like a, a, a standard MVN. And if we want, we can also whiten it. If we want to also whiten it, we can multiply it by these eigenvalues. And then we discard all but the first K features. So let's uh, look at what that looks like with a little diagram. So this is our... Uh, data as we've encountered it and if we compute the eigenvectors of the uh, sample covariance we will find this so this is the direction in which it stretches the most and this is the direction orthogonal to that if we have three dimensions we would have three and the second one would be the direction in which it stretches the second most and if we now invert this transformation what we see is that the eigenvectors become, the, become aligned with the axis. So basically what you're doing is you're taking this and you're making these the axis, axes. So let's look at what happens now when we do this dimensionality reduction. So if we, uh, because our principle, the principle that this PCA uh, works on is that we keep the direction in which there is the most variance. So in this case, we want to keep this direction and we want to discard this one. Why? Well, let's try to show that visually. Basically what happens if we discard uh, the y-axis, so we keep the x-axis and we discard the y-axis, what we're doing is we're setting the y value to zero. So we're projecting it down, projecting all the data down 
to the horizontal axis. If we do that and we then project back to the data space, the data looks like this. So this is sort of the information of our data that we're retaining. We're throwing away everything but this, the points on this line. And as you can see, this is pretty close to the original data. So if we do the, over, if, if we do the opposite, if we retain the uh, axis with the second most variance, or the least variance, we're projecting to the, wide, uh, to the vertical axis, what you see if we project back to the data space is that we end up with this. So all of this variance is lost now. So the idea of, of dimensionality reduction is that you want to maintain variance. I might think, if I'm looking at this in a as a reconstruction perspective, you might think, well, why don't we just use that as a loss function? Why don't we just say, well, we want some kind of transformation to a data space so that if we transform back, we lose as little as of, of the data as possible. So we just draw the distance between the resulting point and the original point, and we want to minimize that distance. Why don't we just do that? Why, why all this uh, fiddling about with variants? Well, it turns out that that's actually the same thing. So vac uh, maximizing the variance is actually the same as minimizing the reconstruction error. So here you see uh, uh, from the uh, required reading, there's a little, nice little diagram. So what we're doing is we're maximizing the variance of our projected data. And the alternative way to think about that is, to, is that we're minimizing the residuals. So this uh, here is our projected point. This is the original point, And we want to minimize this line here. And it turns out that that's the same thing. You can read the details in the required reading. Basically, if you think of this line as our, so we're zooming in onto the, in the picture I showed you earlier. Think of this line as our linear subspace to which our, we are projecting the data that we have to choose. And the dotted line here is the original variance of the data. So this is the distance in the original data from the mean of the data to this point. So that's fixed, that's given. The dotted line, we can change that distance. But we can think of that distance as made up of two points, of, of two components, namely the variance along this subspace plus, uh, or the square of this variance, so the square of the dotted line is the square of this one, plus the square of the residual. How far, how much we're losing by projecting this point down to our subspace. Uh, so let's call this A, this B, and this C. C is fixed, C is given as part of the data, we can't change that. But as we change this subspace, as we choose a different projection, a different uh, subspace to project our data onto, uh, a might grow or shrink, and B might grow or shrink, but the sum of these two stays the same. So if we think about it as maximizing variance, what we're saying is we're trying to choose this line, this black line, so that A is as big as possible. But since there's this constant that stays the same, that is A plus B, maximizing A is the same as minimizing B, because C has to stay the same. Uh, and if you want more details, there's this handy diagram you can work out that this actually works, and that you can actually uh, split this up algebraically. It's part of the required reading, uh, but we'll skip it for now and just summarize PCA as follows. So we are, it's an algorithm that expresses the data in new coordinates aligned with the covariance. The first coordinate, which is the first principal component, is the line along which the data has the most variance. And the second is the remaining various is the highest, and so on. Or you can think about it in terms of this reconstruction error. So the first coordinate is the first, the line along, uh, is the line that best reconstructs the data. And the second coordinate is the line that second best reconstructs the data, and so on. And if you take only the first k principal component, then you get a very good dimensionality reduction method. A uh, couple of small pointers. If you have very high dimensionality, you tend not to compute S, but there are other methods available, um, like the singular value decomposition I talked about. Uh, let's 
consider that implementation details for now, but uh, just uh, if you do this in sklearn, sklearn can do this for you. It's just a parameter that you set. But if you ever want to implement it yourself, you need to uh, worry about this. And of course, you may want to know, well, what should this value of k be? How many, values, how many features should I retain? Should it be 60 or 120? Um, one thing you can do is to plot the amount of variance retained or your reconstruction error per number of features. And usually what you will see is this kind of drop off. Sudden, this inflection point where it suddenly drops, which means that the bulk of your information in your data set is encoded in the first, on this case, four principal components. So if you have that flexibility, then four is where you want to put the cutoff and you want to retain four, uh, four principal components as your features and discard the rest. Uh, this depends on your data, so you would have to make a little plot like this before you can make this choice. So that was a lot of mathematics and a lot of thinking about bases and linear algebra. So why did I put you through this? What's the point? I promised to pay off. So here it is. Uh, a look at some simple examples before we get to the eigenfaces. This is something uh, you might see the way, uh, just to explain the way PCA is often used in research. Um, so what you see here, the case that you see here is uh, of an anatomist uh, or an archeologist, or a, well, I don't know what the exact job description is, but let's say you were studying um, early man. You're looking for fossils of early hominids. Uh, and you want to show that you found one. Now, if you're an anatomist, if you're trained, you can look at the shoulder bone like this and see whether it's a chimpanzee or an early hominid. You just know. I mean, the rest of us have no idea, but if you're trained in these things, you look at it and you see, well, that's clearly just a chimpanzee or that's clearly a hominid, uh, an early, uh, early man, uh, which is fine until you want to publish because that's not very scientific saying this is a, a hominid fossil because I can, I can see it, because I say it is, that's not scientific. You want to somehow quantify the fact that you can tell that this is a hominid fossil. Uh, so what people often do, especially in this field, is uh, they take this, this bone and they measure it. They measure different things. They measure the, from this point to this point, from this point to this point, and you take a couple of hundred measurements and you characterize the bone in that way. And then you do that for some chimpanzees, which are very common, and you find those everywhere, shoulder bones of chimpanzees. And you do that for your hominid fossil, which is very rare and you want to show it. And you do it for uh, humans as well. Uh, so then you get this high dimensional space where one feature you want to show that it's sort of an outlier, that it's sort of a weird looking, uh, weird -looking instance. Um, and in order to then visualize that, you take that space and you reduce it down to, using PCA, you reduce it down to two dimensions. So you get these kinds of clusters where you get the first principal component and the second principal component and you see, well, the chimps and the bonobos, they form a cluster over here. The siamang and gibbons form a cluster over here and so on and so on. Humans are over here. And here we have Australopithecus afarensis and all these Homo, what is it, Ergaster and Neanderthalensis, which form these rare, very, very special and very valuable hominid fossils, of, where the, of which there are very few. So if you find a fossil like that and you can show that it's here in the space and not here, then you've quantified and you've shown this is a very rare and very interesting fossil that I found. So this happens a lot. You will, you'll see this a lot in the literature, uh, different kinds of literature, this kind of application of PCA. Um, but you can do even more cool things with it. One of my favorite examples. Uh, what they did here is a picture of researchers who looked at the DNA of European people. So they sequenced DNA for lots and lots of European people. They looked at different markers, and they somehow, I don't know exactly what the features are, but they transported this DNA, uh, uh, transformed it into a high dimensional feature vector. And then they did PCA on it. And they looked at the two uh, principal components of that data set. And then they colored it. These colors aren't given to the PCA algorithm. They colored it afterwards by the country where the people were from. And what you see 
is that basically the first principal component of this whole set of features of your uh, DNA indicates uh, how far north you live, essentially, or how far north your ancestors lives, live, because it's DNA. Um, and the second principal component indicates how far to the west or to the east you live, or your ancestors live. <coughs> So if you have a lot of immigration and emigration in your history, uh, in your family history, then this doesn't work. But on average, it averages out. And what you see is basically, because of that, what you see in these first principal components, the shape, rough shape of Europe emerges. Which means that if you take a, uh, take a European population, you sample their DNA, and you send those results, you send those sampled, uh, those DNA samples, sequences to an alien planet 100 million light years away, people who've never seen Earth, from our DNA, they can basically reconstruct roughly the geography of Earth using nothing more than principal component analysis. So this is why, yeah, principal component analysis is usually seen as kind of a magic method. Um, let's see how much time I've left myself. For the last example, which is, uh, it will take a little bit more time, but it's another example of, of how magical this method really is. Which is called eigenphases, and it's basically applying PCA to a set of faces, data set of faces. And you can do this yourself, it's very easy, you can play around with this data set. So if you do from SK learn import data sets, and then you do this, you get a set of pictures, which are uh, researchers, I think, from the Olivetti lab. Uh, from a while ago, and there's about 400 uh, pictures of faces in this data set uh, with um, about 10 photographs per, uh, per person, so 40 different people. And it's, uh, they're very nice pictures in that the um, eyes and the mouth and the nose are all in the same space, roughly. So they're very aligned faces. And lighting conditions are very uniform, so we, it's, a, it's a relatively easy, by today's standards, it's a relatively easy uh, data set to analyze. And what we can do is we can take this data set and just like we've done so far with pictures, we just flatten it out to a long feature vector. So every pixel value becomes one feature. So we get, uh, these are 64 by 64 images, I think, so we get 4,096 4 features. And we can have a look at the space that cloud of points in this high dimensional space, we can have a look at that and see what we can do with that. So first let's compute the mean. So we can compute the mean vector of all these uh, vectors and rearrange it back into an image, which gives us the mean face, or the, well, I should say the average face. It's not a mean face, it's a, the average of the data set. Uh, and you can tell that there's a slight male bias in the, um, data set probably because they just photographed their own researchers and there was a slight male bias in their lab. So it looks like a male face, but otherwise it's roughly sort of average. And then we can do, with this cloud of points, we can apply principal component analysis. We can look at the eigenvectors of this, uh, of this um, covariance of this cloud of points, and they look like this. So what we're doing here is we're taking these eigenvectors, which are also points in a, a high dimensional space, and we rearrange them back into a picture so that uh, dimensions along which the eigenvector is positive are colored blue, and dimensions along which the eigenvector is negative are colored red. And we just rearrange it back into an image. And this, apply, and this, every eigenvector basically gives you a sort of direction in the space of faces, in the space of images. So we're basically doing the same thing we've been talking about. This is the mean phase here, and a direction like an eigenvector looks like this. And this just says, in the direction of this pixel, make it a bit more, and in the direction of the other pixel, make it a bit less. And those are colored red and blue. And what we can do then is we can have a look at what the directions, what these directions of the eigenvectors point in, what they mean for our data. So we start with this mean face, which is in the middle. Uh, that's actually between these two points, but roughly looks like this. And what we do here, 
this is the first eigenvector. We add a tiny little bit of the eigenvector to this mean phase, and we see what happens. So here we start with the mean phase. We add a little bit of the eigenvector and add a little bit more and add a little bit more. Or in the other direction, we subtract a little bit more and subtract a little bit more and subtract a little bit more. And what you see is that the first eigenvector broadly corresponds to aging a phase. And you can see this in the eigenvector that the, the nasolabial folds here. These folds become more pronounced and it's more likely to have glasses. So if you move in that direction, the face becomes older. And if you move in that direction, the face becomes younger. And you don't have to start with the mean face. You can also say, we pick this guy from our data set. We start with him. So the nor picture from the data is roughly in the middle. And if we move to the right, he becomes older and older and older. And if we move to the left, he becomes younger and younger. Uh, there should be a gender eigenvector as well. I can't. So the second eigenvector is just lightni lighting. So if the lighting is to the right or to the left, so you're sort of lighting him from a different direction. Uh, I can't tell. I think this might be the gender uh, direction. So this one makes him uh, the the fourth one makes uh, to the left makes him more male, as it were, and to the right makes him more female. And I think my favorite one is probably the one on the bottom here, the fifth eigenvector, which indicates how open or closed the mouth is. So as you can see, whoop, as you can see, if we move to the right, it sort of closes the mouth. And if we move to the left, it opens the mouth and makes him slightly smile. But it doesn't, doesn't just look at the mouth. It actually uh, changes the rest of the face. So it increases the shadow on the nasolabial folds or it purses the lips a little bit. Uh, so it really looks at the whole face to create this thing that that, uh, that is a kind of variance, a direction of variance in our data set. So quite magically, without telling it any of this stuff, PCA has found these high-level semantic directions in our data space that corresponds to, to things that we give a name, like age or smiling or uh, gender. And uh, finally, if we want to describe a face in our data set, or any face in this space, what we can do is we can start with the mean face and slowly add a little bit of each vector. So this basis transformation has given us, for the original data sets, uh, coordinate in this rebased data space. And that those coordinates, basically, it's the eigenvectors are the basis of this new space. So the coordinates tell us in order to make our face, you add this much of the first eigenvector, which puts you here. And then you add this much of the second eigenvector, which puts you here, and so on and so on. And after as few as 60 eigenvectors, remember our space is 4,000 directions big, dimensions big. Uh, and after as few as 60 eigenvectors, we already have, that, have a pretty accurate representation of uh, the original face. So this is a very good way of compressing your data. So the inflection point that we talked about, the few, the f those few eigenvectors that contain most of your data, that will probably happen somewhere around here, where the picture visually stops changing. So after we've included about 30 eigenvectors, we've, inclu we've included most of the data, of the information in the data that we require to recognize the face, to recognize who it is and what their features are. And all the rest are just details, so we can discard those. So this 4,000 dimensional space, we can project down to 30 dimensions, roughly, and we will still be able to do most of the machine learning we want to and get most of the information out of it that we want to. Uh, if you want to play around with this, the code is on GitHub. Uh, and that's my final slide. That's all I have for you today. So uh, thank you for attending, and I'll see you on Monday when we talk about probability. <laughs>